I would now like to introduce Nick. Nick has been conducting avian research since 2001 and has been a biologist with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies since 2010. He currently manages all aspects of the Bird Conservancy's avian, monitor, avian monitoring programs throughout Wyoming and Idaho. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, Mary, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, yeah, I'll just go ahead and get started by introducing the folks that worked with me at Bird Conservancy on this project. So Adam Green, Taylor Gorman, Laura Quattrini, and David Pavlak were all um, critical and, and just uh, getting this study off the ground. And um, I should just go ahead and say that the presentation itself will probably just take 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, so there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. And so I think most people that are joining us today would be familiar with the conservation problems surrounding greater sage grouse. The populations had been in decline, and um, although they are showing some marked improvements in the last couple of years, there's still a lot of concern about uh, maintaining viable populations of sage grouse. There's also evidence that sage grouse are colliding with fences throughout their range. And there's also some existing evidence that marking the fences may reduce the risk of collision. So I'm just going to briefly highlight um, a bit of previous research that was conducted, and all of this, I believe, was part of Brian Stevens' master's work. Um, he looked at uh, looking at collisions of sage grouse in one study area in southern Idaho, and he produced, I think, at least three papers, if not four, from his master's work, so a very nice study. Uh, the first paper that came out of his uh, research project was looking at whether or not marking fences does, in fact, reduce collisions. And in this study, they observed an 83% reduction in collisions when they marked fences. They used a single style of vinyl uh, siding fence marker with uh, reflective tape adhered to it. They produced another paper uh, entitled Multi-Scale Assessment of Greater Sage Growth Fence Collision as a Function of Site and Broad Scale Factors. I thought this was a really nice paper looking at some of those local and landscape level factors that might influence collision risk. Some of their findings from this paper were that post type might influence risk and that wooden posts would reduce collision risk compared to uh, metal or T posts. Also the width of what I'll call the fence panel, which is just the fencing between the posts, so where, fo where posts were spread more uh, further apart, there was a increased risk of collision. Also, they found a regional effect within their study area. They found that the density of fences within the study area impacted collision risk, that the distance to lex and or distance between the fencing and the lex impacted risk. So the closer you are to a lex or the closer a fence is to a lex, the higher the collision risk. And then also topography, so the flatter an area, the, the riskier it is in terms of collision. From this, uh, the local and landscape factors that they looked at, they were able to produce uh, or map a stage growth fence collision risk. And this risk map was based on topography and proximity to lex. So again, flatter and closer to lex results in higher risk. So we wanted to build off this research and expand or just add to this kind of scientific knowledge with a, a, another study looking at the risk of collision for stage growth. And we really had three different objectives. The first was to evaluate different styles of fence marker. So as I mentioned, uh, Stevens et al. used the single style of fence marker that's shown in the middle there with the white PVC vinyl siding and uh, with a, a strip of reflective tape. So we also looked at fly safe markers, which are shown on the left there, and then also the vinyl siding markers that did not have the reflective tape to see how they would uh, do in terms of uh, reducing collision. The second objective was to investigate local and landscape scale factors impacting collision risk, so kind of following up on that second paper that I discussed from Stevens et al. And then thirdly, to validate the collision risk model that, uh, again, Brian Stevens and collaborators produced. And in the discussion section of that third paper that I discussed, where they developed this collision risk model, they, uh, the authors acknowledged the fact that they were extrapolating their uh, study from in southern Idaho out to the extent of the sage grouse range, 
and that there was need to validate that risk model in other areas. So our study took place in Sublette County, Wyoming. And it's an area of high sage grouse density. It's um, known to have uh, greater sage grouse colliding with fences, and we knew that through talking with uh, DLM land managers, uh, particularly Dale Woolwine. Um, nice thing about the BLM lands within Sublette County is that they're relatively easy to access. The public lands are rather contiguous, and it's not quite the checkerboard that uh, some of the other BLM lands in the state display. And then lastly, we knew that there were some cooperative landowners that would be willing to work with us on this project as well. So the design of the study, uh, we obtained a fence layer from the Pinedale BLM field office, and then we used the collision risk map to basically clip the fence line, um, just retaining areas that were in high or medium risk areas based on that collision risk map. And then we looked for LECs that had a minimum of two kilometers of high or medium risk fencing within a three kilometer radius of the LEC. And then of those LECs that remained, we randomly selected 26 of them to include in our study. At each of those 26 LECs, we then took the two kilometers of fencing that was in the high or medium risk areas. We broke it into four 500 meter stretches of fencing and then randomly assigned each of those treatments. So we had the three different style the fence marker, and then we also had a control or an unmarked um, treatment that was also assigned to 500 meters of, within each of the 26 different LECs. So the methods, we installed markers in October of 2013 and March of 2014. As I mentioned, we had the three marker types, and then we had the unmarked control stretches. Where we were actually placing markers on the fence, we put them on the top wire only and we spaced them about two to three feet apart and also two to three feet off of uh, posts. And that was consistent with recommendations from NRCS. We also collected some variables that we could use in, as covariates in the analysis. So we took measurements of six points along each of the 500 meter fence segments. So those measurements were taken 100 meters apart from each other. We looked at vegetation height as well as fence height, so we could start to calculate the amount of exposed fence that spans above the vegetation. We also obtained left information from Wyoming Game and Fish, and we used the collision risk map, as I already described. So I'll briefly, briefly walk you through this image here. Mm -hmm. On the right, see if I can get my mouse over. So here, the green dot where my mouse is, is is the LEC itself, and then within three kilometers, we were able to obtain um, two kilometers of high-risk fencing, and you can see here that we have uh, this blue stretch indicate, is indicating the white markers were placed on the fence, this gray is the reflective, the black was a control stretch that was unmarked, and then the yellow is the fly safe. So in a single day, when an observer was conducting a survey, they would, might park their vehicle over here, and then they could walk down the fence line here, and this would be considered visit number one. When they reach the end and they've surveyed all four sections of the fence, they would then cross over the fence line and then walk back, and the, the return walk back to the truck would be considered visit number two. So there were a minimum of two surveys in a day, um, and then we would visit each fence section or, or lec or all the four fence segments associated with a LEC um, in a single day, and then we would visit that area five to six times each year, and then, as I mentioned, for two years. So we only included confirmed strikes in the analysis, and we had a total of 64 confirmed strikes throughout the two years of our study. What we considered a confirmed strike to be was where there was evidence actually stuck in the fence of a bird colliding. And so that would be feathers that we could identify positively to be a greater sage grouse. Um, so what this means is that we had a lot of other instances where there were feathers on the ground or um, stuck to posts. And a lot of these were removed unless there was additionally feathers stuck in the fence. And we did this because we realized that raptors were really utilizing the fence posts quite a bit, um, both for uh, the consumption of prey and also for just perching and preening as well. And so we saw um, 
quite commonly lots of instances where you've got remains on fence posts. Here, um, this third picture from the top, you've got a lot of feathers on the ground that are all kind of centered around a fence post. This is likely a, a plucking post from a raptor. Um, a little hard to see here in the bottom most picture, but there's uh, a little down feather that's caught on the fence post. We wouldn't want to count anything like that as a collision. This is likely from just perching or preening and that sort of thing. So for the analysis, we used a multi-scale occupancy analysis where we were looking at both local and landscape scale factors that might affect risk of collision. We used multiple visits within a survey to account for incomplete detection, so that's walking one side of the fence and then walking back. And we only included new detections, so we used a removal model. We placed covariates on detection, local occupancy, which was the fence segment, and then the landscape occupancy, or STI, and also uh, known as, that was what we're calling all the fence segments that were associated with the focal lek, so all four together. And then we ran sequential model selection where we first tried to estimate P, then using what we knew about P to estimate psi, and then using what we knew about both detection probability and psi, the large scale, to estimate the small scale occupancy of strikes. So we placed some covariates on each of those three. Um, so detection probability P, the covariates that we put on that were visit effects, survey effects, observer effects, Trap effects were, um, we knew that uh, with the same observer conducting visits one and visits two within a survey, that there's a chance for bias if they were to detect a collision on the stretch of fence. Um, on the first visit, it would be probably more likely that they would again find it on visit two because they would be thinking to themselves, you know, it should be around here somewhere and looking extra hard. So we consider that a trap effect and try to account for that bias uh, in the detection. We also looked at cloud cover and snow cover, thinking that um, cloudy days or um, snowy days where there's a lot of white in the backdrop, that it might be more difficult to uh, detect feathers in a fence, especially if they were white. At the large scale occupancy, we included three covariates, which were year, the number of occupied leks within four kilometers of a focal lek, and then the sum of all lek counts within four kilometers of the focal lek. And those last two were just to kind of get a sense of how many birds are flying around in the area. At the small scale, so the, the 500 meter segment that had the particular treatment on it, we looked at year, the type of treatment or the marker type, and then we also looked at any of the marked fence versus the control unmarked fence. So we grouped all three of those um, marker treatments together and just compared them against the control. We also looked at fence exposure angle. This is a little bit difficult to describe, but if you imagine a line from the end point of the 500 meter fence segment, draw a line from that end point to the focal lek, and then from the focal lek to the other end point, and then you create that angle. Um, so basically a small angle would kind of indicate that a fence line is running straight away from a lek. And we thought that perhaps it would be less likely that birds would be flying across that fence line then as they're during the lecking season, mostly going to and from the lack. We also looked at the distance of the midpoint of each fence segment to the nearest lack. That doesn't necessarily have to be the focal lack. The, we also looked at the height of fence exposed. So that was the height of the top row of the fence, so the top strand of barbed wire, minus the average vegetation height or shrub height um, at the, along the fence line. We also looked at the proportion of fence that was in the high risk area compared to the medium risk area, and we looked at the fence post type. And in our study, we didn't have any fence segments that were entirely comprised of the metal T-posts. We had some that were all wood, and then we had other segments that had a mixture of wood and the metal T-posts. So here's a graphic representation of the multi-scale occupancy model, where we've got visits that are uh, we use to account for P or detection probability. They're nested within treatments, which was the small scale occupancy or theta. And then the treatments, four treatments, were nested within the focal lec, and we use that as a large scale occupancy or psi. And so in total, we had 64 confirmed collisions across two years, 2014 and 2015. You can see we had over three times as many collisions in 2015 as in 2014. Uh, one of the main reasons we think 
that was is that in 2014 it was a very snowy year, and so it's possible that the birds weren't actually on the lex until later. Also, um, in a lot of cases, particularly in the northern part of our study area, um, a lot of the fencing was actually covered up in snow, and so again, there was just less exposed fence for birds to collide with. Of note, 50 of 64 collisions had evidence on the top wire, indicating that uh, probably marking that top wire might um, is, is a reasonable approach. And just as kind of an aside, um, and so folks are aware, so 96 uh, instances we had uh, feathers on the ground where we thought a collision was either likely or possible. We didn't have uh, also corresponding feathers in the fence. And so we actually removed all those instances from analysis. So again, just trying to be conservative about what we're considering to be a collision. So the results, we estimated detection. Um, the null model came out on top, indicating that detection was constant, wasn't greatly impacted by any of the covariates that I described earlier, including snow cover and cloud cover and that sort of thing. Uh, we did estimate detection at almost 94%, so pretty good, um, which for walking surveys, I guess you would kind of expect. Uh, for large-scale occupancy, so this is just kind of at the, the landscape scale for the whole focal lec, um, the occupancy was almost 75 percent, so we had strikes across three-quarters of our, our lecs that we looked at. Um, the occupancy did increase with the sum of nearby lec counts, which seems to um, corroborate what uh, Stevens et al. had found. Also, we found that the occupancy was higher in 2015 compared to 2014, which is unsurprising given the, the raw count of uh, collisions. And ultimately, the null model was again supported for large-scale occupancy. At the small scale, which is really what we were interested in, uh, we looked at the post type, and um, it turned out that when we had a mixture of both wood and metal T-posts, the collision risk was substantially higher than when we had just wooden posts. Um, also, the distance to the nearest left turned out to be statistically significant, uh, with basically the risk of collision uh, going down as you get further and further from wax. Also, uh, the marking offenses did appear to reduce collision risk. We had higher collisions in 2015 at the local scale, and the uh, amount of fence exposed uh, was also statistically significant, with basically as you have more fence sticking up above the shrubs, uh, the risk of collision increased as well. And so the first objective was to look at marker, marker effectiveness. And um, collectively, we found that markers do reduce collision risk. So when we looked across all markers and treated them all the same versus the control, we found that uh, marked fence decreased risk of collision by up to 58%. The white markers themselves decreased risk of collision by 58% as well. The reflective markers did slightly better, reducing collision by an estimated 63%. And the fly safe markers, which were those large yellow markers, decreased risk of collision by approximately 50%. Here's an image of uh, showing likelihood of the uh, collision at the fence segment level. Uh, as a function of distance to the nearest LEC, and we're showing it for both unmarked and marked fences with both a combination of wood or wood and T posts. And you can see in all cases, as we increase the distance to the nearest LEC, the likelihood of strikes in March and April is reduced. Similarly, we can map uh, the risk as a function of fence exposure. So this is in centimeters across the x-axis. And again, this is the likelihood that the stage grouse would strike the 500-meter fence segment. And again, it's shown for unmarked and marked fences with either wood posts or a combination of wood and T posts. And so ultimately, we found that as you reduce the amount of exposed fence sticking up over the top of the shrubs by 15 centimeters, we're expecting a 40% reduction in the risk of collision. So we have two images here on the, the left. I mean, you can see that there's not that much fence sticking up above the shrubs, so we would think that this would be a lower risk area compared to the area on the right, where we have very low shrubs and 
almost the entire height of the fence is sticking up above the vegetation. This image here shows for 2014 and 2015 the likelihood of small-scale occupancy um, at the different treatments and using wood-only posts or wood and T posts. And so the C here is the control, F stands for the fly-safe marker, R stands for the reflective markers, and white is, or W is for the, the plain white markers. And what I think is interesting here is you can see, let me get my cursor here, um, that you have the uh, wood-only uh, post with no markers is in the control actually has a lower probability of collisions than the marked fence stretches that have a combination of wood and T posts. So actually it seems like the wood posts are a better marker than our markers, so to speak. Okay, and then our third objective was to look and validate the collision risk map. And so here we were looking at the proportion of each fence segment that fell within the high versus the medium uh, risk areas. And we actually found that there was no evidence that the collision risk was different across those areas. So whether all the fence was in a medium risk area, it was just as likely to have a collision as a fence segment that was entirely contained within the high risk areas. And again, we didn't validate um, or look at fencing in low risk areas. I have a feeling that um, that would in fact show that these maps are doing good, good work and that um, the high and medium risk areas have higher risk than the low risk areas. Uh, we were trying to maximize our, our data collection and, and sample size, and so we, we kind of um, restricted our uh, marking efforts and our, our survey efforts to the high and medium risk areas only. So what does this all mean for management? Um, I think we can make a couple of recommendations off of this. First is that the markers did, in fact, reduce the risk of collision. Uh, we would recommend the use of the, just the plain white vinyl markers without the reflective tape because they're about a quarter the cost of markers with the reflective tape because that reflective tape is very expensive. Um, they're easy to install, particularly compared to the fly safe markers that took about twice as long to put on the fence. Um, they also worked about as good as the reflective markers and they actually worked a little bit better than the fly safe markers. We also recommend that folks mark fences near Lex that have high counts. That seems fairly intuitive. Um, we recommend that you target marking efforts on fences with short vegetation near the fence that have, again, that uh, larger amount of exposed fence sticking up above the vegetation. And then we would just caution folks um, that are strongly basing their marking efforts in just the high risk area because it seems that the, the medium risk area um, does stand to have a, a large probability of, of collisions occurring as well. So maybe better to focus on the, the real small scale local effects. I uh, just want to make people aware that we have a full technical report that's available. You can Google the Rocky Mountain Aiding Data Center. If you click on the Reports tab and you look under 2016, you'll see a rather uh, intuitive title that says something along the lines of evaluating fence markers, efficacy of fence markers and reducing collisions or something like that. You can click on that and get the full PDF download. Uh, with that, I just want to thank our funding uh, source, which was the NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant. I want to thank co-workers of mine, Jenny and Brittany. Uh, they helped out with some of the field logistics, map making, and some of the GIS covariate uh, collection. Dale, Dale Woolwine of uh, Pinedale BLM Field Office was incredibly helpful with the field logistics for this project. Tom Christensen of Wyoming Game and Fish assisted with, um, he provided a lot of expertise regarding uh, methodology for data collection, doing the surveys themselves, also um, some assistance with feather identification. Tony Mall of, uh, oops, excuse me, of Wyoming Game and Fish provided the um, LEC data. Field technicians, uh, we had two in 2014 and three in 2015, and they were hardy folks that uh, braved the Wyoming elements. And then lastly, we had some uh, assistance from Bird Conservancy staff putting the reflective tape onto the markers, which um, can be another cost that a lot of folks maybe 
concludes uh, my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. I've got my contact info here. Please feel free to contact me if you have questions or um, would like more information. Thanks, Nick, um, so much for the synopsis of your um, or everyone's work on this project. Um, so we do have time for questions, and since, because we have a small group, we could open it up and everybody could unmute their phone lines if they'd like. We could have a discussion, or you could just ask questions via phone. If you want to do that, um, you can unmute your phone by pressing star six. If you're on a microphone, you'll have to figure out how to unmute your microphone. Or if you'd like to go with the traditional means of typing in questions, um, just you can type it into that chat pod and send it to the host, and I can read them to Nick. So we'll see if we get some questions for you, Nick. Um, anything else that you'd like to add? Um, that you may. Uh, yeah, nothing comes to mind right now. Okay. Mary, Nick, this is John uh, John Rice. I'm uh, wondering, Nick, one of the photos that you showed had uh, on on both the top two lines or top two wires uh, feathers. Uh, one looked to be right above the other. Would you have recorded that as just a single incident or as two? Yeah, we would just record that as a single incident. The only time um, when we had that we would consider two strikes within a single panel is if they, um, and I forget the exact number here, but if they were further apart than the average wingspan of a sage grouse. Um, either way, uh, that wouldn't impact our analysis because we did an occupancy approach. So mm -hmm. once you get one strike, it's considered occupied. Um, and what about, uh, you mentioned that you had, I think, 96 other instances of collision, and I'm assuming that must be birds on the ground or something? Yeah, right. So that was um, feathers strewn on the ground that didn't look like it was just a predation event or a, a, a plucking uh, event. Right. Um, so where we thought that it was the feathers were related to a bird colliding with the fence, but we couldn't find any feathers in the fence itself to, to confirm. And so just to be conservative, we excluded those from analysis. So if you were to, to add that information to to the project just anecdotally, how would you how would you say that might change anything in terms of your your uh your results and whatnot? Would that be would it be totally confirmatory or were, would it would it change some of the way you might look at things or Yeah, I did notice just and this is just kind of speaking off the cuff, but from being out there, um I did notice that a lot of the strikes or collision evidence was very clumped together, like there were um, real local scale site level factors that were impacting collision risk. And so I kind of suspect that we would just gain stronger power uh, mm -hmm. in our assertion of, of what's important. I think we would see a stronger effect for markers reducing collisions. I think we would see a stronger effect for the amount of fence that's sticking up above the shrubs. Um, yeah, I think it would just give us greater power. Thanks, John. Yeah, uh, we have questions, John. Thanks. Sure. We have a question that was typed in from D. Bills. Um, is there any information on the significance of the collisions, injuries, fatality rates? Yeah, I can only say that we. Um, are fairly certain of one confirmed mortality from all the collision evidence that we found. There was one instance where we found a whole carcass and it had a, a very small puncture hole right in the head, um, and there was, of course, feathers in the fence right next to it. So um, that was kind of a confirmed mortality due to the fence. My suspicion is that a lot of these fence collisions ultimately result in mortality, um, whether that's you know instant or if it's a day later because of a broken wing and it makes them more susceptible to predation and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but yeah, that was something that we really didn't look at. We, um, I've been told and kind of from anecdotally from my experience, these birds can sometimes move a long way from the fence after a collision. Um, sometimes we would find um, the bulk of the feather pile um, 
which we assumed to be associated with the collision. We would find feathers on the fence, and then 60 yards away, we would find um, the bulk of the feather pile, like where the, maybe the animal had expired there and then um, been consumed by something else. So yet no real way to look at a probability of mortality resulting from a collision from this study, but I would expect it to be rather high. Thanks, Nick. So we have a little bit of time left. If anybody would like to unmute themselves, uh, feel free to ask a question or to type one in. I'd like to ask a question. This is Vicki Heron. Um, I noticed in one of the pictures that there was some woven wire fence in there and other pictures that were um, barbed wire and the number of wires seemed to vary. So was that, um, I didn't hear you talk about the, the fence type at all. So w was that one of the covariates or considered at all? We did consider the um, number of strands and that didn't come out as a significant uh, variable. Um, we did not look at whether or not it was the, the sheet fencing, I think a lot of people call it, where it's got um, basically kind of the panels, uh, um, it's got wire, wires going north and south, or up and down and left and right um, for the bottom uh, couple of strands. So we didn't look at that. Um, I think probably that would increase the risk slightly, but by and large I think it would be fairly difficult for a sage grouse to fly between your standard barbed wire strand. Um, I guess it's possible, but yeah, that, that wasn't something that we tested explicitly. But I would agree with you that probably in general sheet fencing provides a greater risk to sage grouse than the barbed wire. I think probably getting linking that back to the earlier question too, um, I would think the sheet fencing probably results in a higher probability of mortality resulting from a collision. Um, because they're really only like a two-inch two by maybe four-inch um, square pattern, and hard for a stage for us to fit through that. Right, and, but some um, uh, barbed wire fences may have only three strands and others four, so there may be more space in between the wires that a, a grouse might actually try to get through. I don't know. Just, just curious if if that could be considered a factor in, in collision. Yeah, I think that you're absolutely right and that that could impact uh, the risk of collisions and it's just not something that we looked at in this study, but it's a great thought. Um, mm -hmm. We also um, ran into a little bit of elk fencing and I think it would be really interesting to look at that as well. Um, obviously there you've got fences going up maybe, what, seven, eight feet tall, um, seems like it could uh, affect the collision risk. Yeah, it does. Um, so I have another question. Um, you talked about shrub height along the uh, section of the fence and that you measured shrub height and then averaged it. Was that correct? Yeah, so what we did is we measured it at each of the strikes or collision sites and then we also took measurements at, along six panels that were 100 meters apart. Um, along just to kind of get the average for each fence segment. Okay. Because this, even in this picture, you can see here there's quite a quite a variation, and I just, it, I just, uh, I mean, I, obviously there are, in one of your previous pictures there was a you know a, a stretch where it was all very low, and and then other places where it's all much higher, but. It, there are also these areas where you get both. Absolutely, yeah, and we could have done a more thorough job of trying to estimate, you know, the vegetation height and the, the fencing height along the entire stretch. Uh, it's a limitation of our work, but uh, I think six sites and taking the average along 500 meter stretches, it's yeah. somewhat informative. Yeah, it'd be quite a workload to try to measure all the shrubs, obviously, but um, I, but just if there was less of potential for a strike if the vegetation was higher, just kind of interesting to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you.
Yeah, thanks, Vicki, for your questions. Um, got a, uh, a note that someone said thanks for the nice presentation. And um, anybody else? Would anybody else like to ask a question via phone or computer mic? If so, speak up now. All right, um, Nick. It looks like uh, looks like we may be finished. Uh, I have no more questions in the queue. Meaning nothing typed in and no one's speaking up. So. Um, I think we'll go ahead and close up then. Um, unless, do you have anything you want to add in, in closing? I oh, just want to thank uh, both you and, and John Rice for the opportunity to present uh, to the Southern Rockies. So thanks. Great. Yeah. We'd like to thank you too, Nick, for presenting and spending the time. And I'd also like to thank our audience for attending today's webinar. And as I said earlier, I'll be sending out the webinar recording and a PDF of the slides as well as Nick's contact information if you didn't write it all down. Um, it'll be coming probably sometime next, next week. So thanks everyone again and um, enjoy your day. Goodbye.